Good afternoon and happy new year. I hope you're all off to a great start this year, 2023. My goodness, I don't even know if I can count how many years I've been doing these predictions, uh, but here we are in 2023 and I'm gonna do my best to summarize all the conversations I have, the interviews I have with experts, the conferences that I go to and, and the videos I watch and all, all the data. Uh, that I am lucky enough to be able to get to see and summarize and present to you and what what I think and hope will uh, will be an accurate um, summary of what we can expect in 2023. Because not knowing is where people get stuck, but kind of knowing what's coming and, uh, you know, can make all the difference. All right, so a few more people are just joining us. I am uh, going to get off screen. I'll come back on when uh, we're, we get to the Q&A section, but uh, I don't want to take up my, I don't want to take up space with my face here. <laughs> so here we go. All right, welcome to the 2023 housing market forecast. I'm Kathy Fedke, co-founder of Real Wealth, and really happy that you're joining me here today for my 2023 housing market forecast. We've been doing this for many years, and um, I've been pretty accurate most of those years because I'm lucky enough to be able to interview experts on the Real Wealth show, uh, speak at lots of conventions and conferences and, and talk to investors nationwide to hear what they're doing. Of course, we have our team of experts nationwide who help our members at Real Wealth acquire real estate and they have their finger on the pulse of their markets. So I just compile all that data into what I think we can look forward to in 2023. So let's dive in and again thank you for joining me here all right so the disclaimer again this is just my opinion always always check with your cpa and your uh attorney to make sure that real estate is right for you and of course there's uh you know past performance is no guarantee of future real estate investments always come with risk of course you you reduce that risk with the more due diligence that you do, which is what we're providing here today to help you on your journey. And speaking of that, we have an upcoming virtual event. I promise we'll be doing some live events, but we've had a lot of people really uh, enjoy these virtual events because they can't get to our live events. So we're going to be doing what would normally be a live event virtually from the comfort of your couch or living room or wherever, your office. Uh, we will be talking about investors game plan in a buyer's market. And that's Saturday, February 11th from nine to 4 p.m. It will be packed with powerful education. Plus you'll have the chance to hear from 10 of the representatives from different markets that, uh, you know, that we recommend at Real Wealth. So you can register in this weekend's newsletter. Again, that's Saturday, February 11th. Okay. so. I've been interpreting headlines for a long time. My uh, past is in the media. You know, in the media, I was a news reporter, a kind of part-time anchor and, and news writer in my early days. I got a degree in it at San Francisco State University. And then when I uh, really jumped into real estate full-time, I was able to use that kind of background in my relationships and connections in the media to help you know, some of the anchors and the reporters understand data because it's very confusing. It's presented oftentimes in a way that uh, can be scary. Uh, and so I would be invited into these newsrooms as a guest, not as a, a ho you know, not as an anchor anymore, but as a guest to help explain what's going on. So that's what I'm going to be doing today is really just looking at the headlines and, and helping us interpret them and how that affects us as investors. So 2022 theme, looking back, I would say all of us could agree, at least from an economics perspective and housing perspective, that inflation was the story of the year. And uh, boy, did that have an impact. Well, today there was breaking news and it was fairly good, I suppose, compared to the past, but inflation cooled off in December, and this news just came out today, uh, to six and a half percent but the Fed is likely to keep hiking interest rates. So that's the story is like inflation's heading in the right direction, but not fast enough. We're not there yet. Uh, so the Fed is probably gonna keep doing what they've been doing, but maybe at a slower pace. 
So to sum that up, this is from NBC. Uh, December inflation report from November to December from 7.1 to 6.5%. That's pretty good. And you can see on the right picture here that it's really gasoline is the is the thing. Energy is what's really come down in cost that's had the biggest effect on these numbers. And again, this is down from June's high where it was a 41-year high when the CPI hit 9.1%. And that was a scary time. People didn't know if that was going to keep continuing in that trajectory, but it seems to have turned a corner. And uh, you can see also, in, in many ways, global food prices. You remember early this year, or I guess a year ago, early last year, there was concern that we wouldn't have food. And now we can see that you know the global food price index is back down, actually lower than it was a year ago. Beef prices are down, all commodities are down, lumber, thank goodness for the real estate industry, is down 70% since January. Ugh, for those of us in construction, this is really helpful. Uh, gasoline down 33% since the summer. Again, this is all affecting uh, the inflation reports, which affects the economy and what the Fed is doing, of course. Propane down. So this is this is all good news. And so Bloomberg came out with this report, I think just today or yesterday, saying inflation cools again, putting the Fed on track to downshift. Uh, so that's good because when you look at this chart, you can see they have you know been aggressively putting on the brakes on the economy with these rate hikes starting in March. Um, and then, of course, bam, 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 they've just been aggressive in ways that I certainly haven't seen uh, them move this quickly in one year to attack an inflation. Uh, they they were not going to let this get out of hand, although they kind of let it get out of hand by starting this in March. You could see if, uh, if we knew that inflation, and I guess they didn't know, uh, it was kind of obvious, at least in housing, um, that they would have started this process much sooner and much more gradually. And the Fed's taken a lot of flack for this. Uh, but they obviously, you know, didn't see it coming, didn't probably realize they were a big part of it <laughs> and uh, and had to act quickly, kind of like a speeding car with the economy being the speeding car, just having just getting slammed on the brakes. So that's shocking versus a very slow and gradual slowdown. So I would say uh, we're not at the end of the breaks yet. It's a, a, we haven't stopped. Powell uh, says that the Fed will not change the 2% inflation goal because this has been coming up uh, like why 2%? Can't we have higher inflation? Why do we have to, um, you know, do we really have to wait? Because it could be a while if, if, if inflation is still at 6%, uh, you know, wow, how long, how much longer is it going to take for us to get to this 2% inflation goal? Well, Powell said, and he's been doing what he says lately, Powell said the Fed will continue to press forward with increases and officials have penciled a 5.1% funds rate for next year and a lower one the year after. So based on what Jerome Powell is saying right now, this is going to continue through 2023 and possibly 2024 if we don't get to 2% inflation. And it seems like he doesn't really care what kind of damage is done to the economy as long as we get to this goal. So it's just really important for us to always pay attention to the Fed and what they're saying and take it seriously. Uh, because anyone who didn't listen last year is paying the price this year um, if they were taken off guard by what happened because he kept his word. We were warned a year ago. It was a year ago. Look at this. In um, January 31st of 2022, the Fed, you know, this article was out, expected to raise rates seven times this year to fight inflation. Uh, and, and then this article, Fred, Federal Reserve, points to interest rate hike coming in March. And he says, I think there's quite a bit of room to raise interest rates without threatening the labor market. Now, a lot of people didn't pay attention or they didn't really understand what this meant. I was uh, on a debate at a pretty large event, the best ever conference in, uh, it was in Denver last year, and I think it was in February. And I had a room of, gosh, I feel like it was over a thousand. It could could have been 1,500 commercial investors. It's a commercial event. 
and I had to debate. My side was that we were going to have less sales volume in 2022 than 2021. And most of the room didn't agree with that until the end of the debate uh, when they did, because I was pretty convincing, basically saying, look, the, the Fed is telling you they're going to slow down the economy. Uh, they're going to suck money out of the economy. And that is going that's that's going to affect things. People aren't going to have the money they had to to buy commercial real estate. And um, so it was kind of surprising at how that there were there was a room full of experienced investors kind of not paying attention to this at the time. And even up through the summer, still seeing a lot of people acting like things hadn't changed, still paying too much for commercial real estate. I'm not really realizing what an impact higher rates would, you know, would be on the commercial real estate industry. That is where I'll talk about it a bit later, but that is where we're going to see probably some pretty major pain this year. But uh, Jerome Powell was correct in what he said a year ago, which is there was room to raise rates without really affecting the labor market. He was right. Look at this. In fact, just our the last report showed unemployment down again, down, edged down to three and a half percent. This isn't really what they want. You know, they're trying to slow the economy, not create more jobs, but 223,000 new jobs. Um, it is very, very strong job market. So when people say we're in a recession, you kind of have to say, well, that's weird because there's usually not job creation in a recession. You certainly don't generally see three and a half percent unemployment in a recession. So, you know, he was right. Raising rates, slowing down the economy and the job market currently is still strong. So what created the inflation then? Uh, and, and it's pretty basic answer. It's usually too many dollars chasing too few goods. You got lots of money chasing something there's not enough of and people bid it up. And obviously that was classic for real estate a year ago, exactly a year ago, people were still bidding properties up, even knowing that uh, the breaks were gonna come on. Well, maybe they didn't know. Um, in, in real estate. Now, if they locked in those low rates, they're probably still glad they did it even if they overpaid, uh, you know, just locking in those low payments. But basically, when you've just got not enough of something and everybody wants it, that's inflation. Um, what's interesting and, and the way you stop that is you stop allowing people to get those dollars, right? You, you, you either have to increase goods or decreased dollars. And since 90% of dollars are on credit, which is fascinating, it's just, you know, the US is, the US economy is based on debt. So 90% of dollars are just from people borrowing. So for example, uh, we could look here and see, let's, let's look at this right before the rate hikes you had the overnight lending rate close to zero. So if you were gonna go get a credit card or buy a car, you know, the things that stimulate the economy when, when people buy stuff, that's when you've got, you know, companies expanding and hiring workers and, you know, it's, it's all this demand. So somebody says, hey, I wanna buy a car. They, they realize, hey, I can get this for 1% you know, interest or two or three, and the payment say is $600 a month and they get this fancy new car and yeah, we'll do that. When you fast forward to today and that payment's double, you know, so now that $600 payment is 1,200, you might not get that car. So that's how the, the economy slows down is people just stop borrowing and that creates less dollars because the way that the banking system works and the way that you know the financial system works is that when you want something, that money's created. Nobody had to put money down on the car, right? They just said, oh, I want this car. And then suddenly that money was created in the form of debt and the person pays it back in payments and, um, and money's created. But when that person says, eh, I don't think I can afford this payment, that money's not created. And that's how, that's part of how less dollars are created to slow down inflation and all this buying. Of course, we know that happened with mortgage rates. We had, you know, not enough supply, too much demand, and that had a lot to do with this, the borrowing, right? If you were to 
buy a house at 3%, your payment was like, oh, wow, this is less than rent. Why would I not do this? Uh, but today, there's a lot of reasons why, <laughs> and I can show you on the next slide. 15 million people were priced out of the market when rates went up this year. So this, this shows you, this is a pretty cool chart from the National Association of Home Builders. You could see it at 3.2%. A $450,000 house, which is the median new home price, it went up that high th this year. The monthly mortgage payment was $1,900. So, yeah, that's that's not bad. That for a new home, if you rented it, you'd probably be paying more, right, in rent. Uh, so, the in, uh, the minimum income needed for somebody to buy that house was $104,000. There were 44 million people able to do that. Now you come to this number, well, let's let's say 7%. When rates were at 7% over the summer and that $450,000 house was now 30% higher in cost, two, $2,900 in, in monthly mortgage payment. There's a whole lot of people who are going to say, I can't do that or I don't want to do that or it's cheaper to rent or whatever it is. And you, and you look at the difference, tw only 26 million people could afford it. So 15 million people priced out. Now, as interest rates have gone down a bit since since the peak, that's brought new more buyers in. You can see that's like, what is it? 3 million people who are like, oh, now I can't afford this at 2,700. So interest rates really, really make a difference. Uh, and then coming to this again, uh, with the higher interest rates, you had to be making this much money to be able to afford that same house. And you can see a lot less people have that much money than this bracket here. So interest rates do need to go down to tap into this group. In the meantime, they'll probably be renters. So again, no surprise, it shouldn't have surprised anybody that home sales tumbled. And these are the headlines you see all the time and people sometimes forget to see that we're talking about home sales, not home prices. Home sales tumbled more than 7% in November, the 10th straight month of declines. And you can see oh, year over year, 35% down. Well, no wonder you're seeing layoffs in the real estate industry, particularly with mortgage companies, because you gotta you gotta look at this kind of elastic economy we've had. We were going full speed, the Fed slams on the brakes, but before that, when companies were booming and mortgage brokers were having to hire and they couldn't keep up with demand, and then bam, the brakes get put on, they already just hired all these people, they have to let them go because 2021 was one of the most home sales ever, right? So now, uh, you know, those people had to get laid off. So it's it's like I said, it's an elastic economy. People, companies had to expand in, in 2021, and then they had to pull back and let people go in the real estate industry in uh, 2022. But this is the line I want you to look at. The median sales price still rose three and a half percent to $370,000 from a year ago. So in spite of everything I just said, sales down, millions of people priced out, how on earth could the median sales price continue to rise? That just seems crazy, doesn't it? But those of you who listen to my show and listen to our webinars at Real Wealth, you know why. It's, it's exactly what we talked about before, inflation. It's dollars after too many dollars after too little supply. And so let's look at the supply. This summer, you know, obvi obviously, okay, supply was down when interest rates were down. Everybody, so many more people could afford to buy a house. As interest rates went up, fewer people could afford to buy. People started to freak out. They didn't know what was happening. They thought the mar housing market was going to crash, all the reasons. Um, so inventory started to increase. But then, in July, when inflation peaked and the Fed was just on a rampage trying to destroy the economy, inventory went down again, still is. So what in the world was happening? Well, this, 
pending home sales down 37% from last year. Because who would, you know, who who's going to put their house on the market uh, when they're locked into low rates? And, uh, you know, yeah. It, it, and then new home construction continued to slow in October so that you've got less supply and then new listings are down. Because again, people don't want to put their house on the market. People are having a hard time, you know, trying to buy. So why would you try to sell? And then you've got builders stopping, you know, their construction or slowing it down, uh, which is leading to lower inventory, all at a time when this is happening. The largest demographic, ages 29 to 33, of the millennials are forming households, or they'd like to anyway. They don't want to live with mom and dad forever. Maybe living with mom and dad is okay when you're out of college and, you know, trying to figure things out. But when you get married and you're starting to have children, you got dogs, I don't think anybody's super happy in that scenario. So, you know, this demographic would like to form households and they're either going to rent or they're going to buy something. Um, so the low inventory in housing comes at a time when demand is at its peak. So that's what's holding prices up. Now, I just yesterday interviewed Barry Habib. I'm so excited. Uh, if you don't know who he is, he's pretty famous in the mortgage industry. He owns uh, MBS Highway. And for mortgage brokers, you know exactly who I'm talking about. He's like the number one guru in the mortgage industry because you know this thing called the rate lock. Well, you know, you go to your mortgage broker and, and uh, you know, you apply for a loan and you got to lock your rate or you don't have to but if rates are pretty good you want to you want to lock your rate at a good rate but it's locked so if rates get better after you lock it then you're like dang it why you know and and the mortgage broker might lose you because this person might just go find another br mortgage broker and do a new loan to, that has a better rate so Mortgage brokers don't want to be wrong when they lock a rate. So they go to Barry Habib. He, you subscribe to his service at MBS Highway, and he um, really helps mortgage brokers understand what's coming with mortgage rates so that they don't lock when rates are high and then lose customers when rates go down. Um, and he gives daily updates and stuff. So I was a mortgage broker in the early 2000s, and um, you know I I definitely listened to him then, and it was just super cool to interview him yesterday. So that that show should be out next week. Uh, but you can see one of the things that he said on the show, and this is his slide, is that inflation drives mortgage rates. So, and we've seen that, right? Um, a 30 year fixed rate mortgage is this one and this is inflation. So as inflation went up, so did mortgage rates. Uh, because a lot of reasons, and you can Google him, go on YouTube and look up, he explains it really well. And then of course, when my show comes out, he'll explain it. Uh, but when inflation starts to come down, so do mortgage rates and that's what we've seen. So in spite of the Fed continuing to hike um, the overnight lending rates, mortgage rates were going down and people were confused about that, but it's because inflation's going down. So he believes that we will see in mortgage rates down to the, down in the fives by kind of, he was, I think he was saying in spring of this year, a lot of people are saying in summer. So that is kind of an interesting concept for us, right? In, in real estate, what would that look like? If rates, if he was right, and uh, and rate and uh, inflation went down, here's one of the reasons he he believes that, and it's shelter costs are slowing. So you could see that national rent growth is slowing down, uh, and that's really with apartments. That's what they look at more. It's the rent growth, and and we know that it's slowing down. It's still up. It's still pretty high, but I mean, oh my gosh, it was you know, close to 15% uh, at its peak and some markets double that, you know, so rent growth was just insane. And that um, represents 39% of the CPI, so massive. And it's coming down, but the data lags because think about it, you're in a one-year lease, a two-year lease with somebody and when they renew, that's when, that's when uh, you'll start to see things shift. Mm. 
excuse me, into lower rates. And that, so the data is very lagging and he believes that it's gonna start to show and really affect the CPI in a few months. So again, something to consider. All right, so when we go back to this chart that I showed you earlier, we're kind of at this range right now. If we get back to five, like he said, that's five million more people who will be able to buy. And that's what we have to pay attention to. He is a firm believer that there will be a frenzy because again, you have low supply, inventory down, you have this massive group of millennials wanting to form families and 5 million of them will be able to buy as soon as those rates go down to 5%, which he thinks is gonna happen either this spring or this summer. So again, this is like this little tiny window of opportunity right now when everybody's afraid, when there's pessimism everywhere and uh, you know, we can make offers on properties where there's no other offers. So you can negotiate, you can ask for points to, you can ask the, the seller to pay points to pay down your rate so that you are in the 5%. You can get discounts on these homes. I mean, this is your time. This is oddly, it's a buyer's market and, and the masses get it wrong almost every time. They, they want to buy fanatically and in a frenzy in a seller's market, meaning the seller has the power. And just just a year ago, literally just one year ago, uh, you, you couldn't even get inspections on the property you want to buy because there was too many people in line who, who were like, I'll waive them. It's okay. I don't even need an appraisal. Just here's the cash. I want this house. I'll pay 100000 over asking. This is a year ago. <laughs> And uh, and and that's when the masses come in when it's really not ideal, uh, you know, for in those terms because you've got so much competition. A year later, that same house costs less. It the price it it may not you probably can negotiate it. It may not cost a lot less than it did a year ago, but you've got some negotiating power. And you can have the seller because they're more desperate now help you buy down your rate so that you're getting a kind of a similar rate that you would have had last year. And yet we know that rents are going up. So it is this really incredible opportunity to get in when, when there's not the competition there. It is a buyer's market. And just follow the money. Don't listen to me, listen to the money. Wall Street has $110 billion set aside for home buying. That's Blackstone, KKR, just among some of the firms gearing up to purchase single family rentals. We're gonna have more competition in our industry. Again, over here, you can see 110 billion. Uh, the money is enough for roughly 400,000 homes. Institutional investors already own about 700,000. That's only 3% of the nation's 20 million single family rentals. So it's still a tiny percentage. But according to Roofstock, uh, MetLife Investment Management predicts it will grow to 40% by 2030. Just wow. <laughs> Wall Street is looking at our industry. Can you imagine it growing by 40%? Or not by 40%, that they own 40% when they only own 3% currently. So they see something, right? They see something and we need to see it too because we're more nimble. We can get in there and find better deals than they can. They're they've got too much money and it's too much overhead and we have, you know, we're individuals that can go in and get better deals and manage our portfolio before they buy everything, right? Um so where, you know, where do you buy? U-Haul Growth Index, this comes out every year. I love this. This is the one-way trips, which basically tells you where people are moving to. And as normal, as it has been for many years, Texas is number one, Florida number two, South Carolina three, North Carolina four, Virginia, Tennessee, Arizona, Georgia, Ohio, Idaho, Colorado, Utah, and then you see number 50 is California, as it has been for many years. People leaving California 
people leaving Michigan, Illinois, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, these expensive states that have high taxes, people are leaving them and going to, again, number one and number two, Texas and Florida, where there's no state income tax. The Carolinas, where it's low, and Tennessee, very low. Um, you know, we, you've still got, in addition to the millennials, you've got baby boomers, massive amount of baby boomers wanting to cut their overhead, right? Wanting to be able to retire and going to places where they can sell, they can sell in California, take all their money and go buy in Texas or Florida or any of these markets and, and possibly live free and clear. So still lots of migration happening and, and U-Haul kind of gives us a clue. This is why we started our single family rental fund at Real Wealth uh, through our subsidiary Grow Developments. It's the North Dallas Rental Fund. We picked Dallas for the reasons that you just saw. It's, it's just still experiencing massive growth. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you can go to growdevelopments.com and find out. This is a, a very passive investment for those of you who just don't want to deal with buying or getting loans or dealing with uh, the, the management of your properties. You invest with us. We do all of that for you. And uh, we split with the investors 75-25. And we're also, my partner is buying the properties, renovating them, and all the equity goes back into the fund. So it's kind of like a Burr fund where we, uh, our last acquisition was 120,000. Uh, we put 20,000 into it. And I think the ARV was around 220,000. So about 60,000 equity that goes into the fund to be split with the investors. Now she can't do that outside the fund with Real Wealth members because uh, we just don't do that model. There's too much risk to buy an unrenovated property through real wealth because trying to manage that from afar is difficult, but it can be done in the fund. All right, so again, from a single family rental landlord perspective, rents are still up in 2022. The, the growth, the rate of growth is declining, which is probably a very good thing. Rent growth was at you know 14%, like I said, and in some areas, double that. Uh, so we're we're seeing it come back to still really high, much much higher, double than what it was, you know, when I started investing. Um, and you know, just kind of it was steadily around between two and four percent. So to have rents go up so dramatically over the last couple of years was not healthy for anybody, certainly not for the families trying to rent those homes. So rent growth's coming back down, still not back to average. And again, all comes back to that inventory problem. There's just not enough rentals out there or homes or, you know, for sell homes to meet the demand. And it always varies by market. Miami was the clear winner. I, I don't know what in the world is happening in Miami, but I think I know. I know a lot of uh, New York financial firms moved to Miami, a lot of a lot of companies. It's really kind of turned into quite a quite an impressive city, which is so not something I expected with climate change. I thought people wouldn't go near Miami, which is interesting. You got you know, again a lot of New York funds that are you know, moving to what was supposed to be underwater. But anyway, maybe maybe that's not going to happen. So uh, massive rent growth in Miami, and it has slowed to half, but half is still, wow, so strong. Orlando, one of the cities that we really think is great. Um, look at that. The rent growth, it's actually increased. <laughs> that's crazy. And uh, uh, yeah, so something's happening in Orlando. And um, let's see. Yeah, we've got Boston, Tucson, or some more. Charlotte, you can see rent growth has slowed, but um, still extremely strong. Though, so, yeah, it's interesting times. Interesting times. Rent, again, rent's rising in some metros. You can see Indianapolis came in number one over the last six months, up 1%. So, again, something happening in Indianapolis. It's it's a it's a great city. We have a wonderful team there. If you're wanting to buy rental properties, we've worked with them for years. They've always they they helped me out on a really difficult apartment I bought in that area. Just a really great team. Well, it was years ago, but uh, Indianapolis really strong. Look at Tampa since March of 2020, th up 37 percent. Just wow. Uh, again, Cincinnati. 
didn't really see a lot of rent growth this over the last six months. Um, there we go. But over the over the last 12 months, six percent. So rent growth slowing, but still up from you know where it had been. So the big question is, is it safe to buy real estate given everything I just said if we think there might be a recession coming? So I can tell you uh, there probably is a recession coming. I, I would say you ask anybody and they'll say, yeah, there's probably a recession coming. Uh, people thought we were in one early this year, but then we had a good you know, th Q3. So we're gonna find out what, how Q4 did. Um, pretty soon, I hope, but it doesn't look like we're in one right now. A lot of people were saying this was all due to supply chain issues these first two months. I don't know, but uh, if it was a recession, it was short and we got out of it. So who knows? But many people are expecting with the, including the Fed, <laughs> with the Fed continuing to raise rates this year, there will probably be a recession. So what does that mean for you if you just bought a bunch of housing, you know, in the next couple of years, if you bought a, or not a couple of years, a couple of months um, to get into buying real estate before all these hedge funds come in and before all the home buyers come in over the, over the summer when uh, mortgage rates go down? Um, well, you know, this is why you want to be in areas that have really strong job growth because there will be job losses, but there'll be job losses, uh, in certain areas and, and continued job growth in others. So really focusing on where the strongest job growth is is gonna help you through that recession. And then it's important to understand that out of the last, I think it was nine recessions, there was only one that actually affected home prices. So recessions don't necessarily affect home prices, especially given some of the facts about it. So, um, and those facts being, well, I have, other slides there about um, the strength of the current homeowner today. Now, back in 2005, the strength of the current homeowner in 2005 was all based on credit, right? It was easy credit, easy lending. Um, anyone could get a loan, which drove up prices at the end and made a bubble at that time. And then when those uh, adjustable, re adjustable rate mortgages were due and people had to pay the real rate they they couldn't afford it they couldn't afford it when they first applied for the loan but it was skewed to where they only had to pay a, um, a teaser rate so back then this is when kiyosaki kind of warned me and my audience i know i'm sure you've heard this but that you know hey these are going to reset we know there's going to be a crash coming get out of the bubble territories and get into the fundamentals, get into the areas, like I said, that have job growth, that have population growth and where the numbers are still in a line, in alignment where you, it's still affordable to, to either rent or own. That's how you stay out of the storm. And that's what we did. In 2005, Rich and I listened to Kiyosaki and we went to Texas and we bought, I don't know, about 12 homes like this. Again, we could do it with no money down and very, it was very easy to get loans back then, but we, we picked great assets and this was um, one of them. This was a, about $140,000 brand new home in Rockwall, Texas. Uh, that cash flowed with the rents being around 1500 at the time, I think, I'm, I'm guessing, I can't remember, but it was something like that. And uh, it just it just really made sense. And these homes were beautiful. They were in A-class neighborhoods with a rated schools and they stayed rented even during the downturn because people still need a place to live and uh you know these we were in a high growth high job growth area so these properties stayed rented during the downturn so what we learned then and i i know still applies today is that you don't have to worry about recessions if you're invested in areas with the job and population growth that are still affordable, that the average person can still afford the rent and the average person can still afford to buy the home, um, especially when rates come down to, you know, the, the somewhere in the fives. And that it's in the path of progress, that the city's investing in itself. They're expanding in some ways, bringing on new uh, businesses and expanding freeways and new hospitals and new schools and so forth. This is, if you can get in front of that, then you get cash flow and most likely appreciation. 
And then this is probably the key. This is what I really want to leave you with is you've got to look at the long-term big picture. I just did a kind of a counseling session with somebody who's sitting on a lot of money and is just frozen, just paranoid, just can't, can't, can't do anything with this, doesn't know what to expect and feel safer in cash. And I just said, you know, what is it you're trying to do? Well, this particular person was making enough money to, they don't need the cash flow. They were looking for something that would replace their income 20 years from now, you know, not even 10 years from now, 20 years from now. So I just said, you know, if, if you happen to overpay today, let's just say that prices go down five or 10%. Do you think you'll notice that in 20 years? You know, do, do you think that you'll say, gosh, darn it, I, I paid $10,000 too much for this property. What we know for a fact is that inflation is actually here for good. Uh, it's not going away. Just look at how home prices have gone up over the last 10 years, over the last 20 years. If you think that's going to stop, well, you've got to look at the at what's causing it. And what's causing it is, remember, too many dollars chasing too little supply. And we know that our government and the Fed is pretty addicted to creating more dollars. They just did it again. They just passed another spending bill when we're already in debt, a lot of pork in it. Politicians like to spend money and that is, is creating more money that creates inflation. It's been happening since the 70s. So when you look at where the price will be, it will almost certainly be twice what you paid in 20 years, probably in 10 years. So you you know you you buy a $200,000 house, let's say a $300,000 house, and let's just say it went down in value to 270. And you're like, oh gosh darn it, I I didn't buy at the peak. But in 10 years, that that property's worth $600,000. Do you care? Not if it's been cash flowing all along the way and you've been getting tax benefits along the way, you, you have asset protection, your values increase over time, and you know, you, you're able to pass this on to your kids. It, look at the long-term picture and, and don't be so focused on timing things perfectly and making sure you're buying at the bottom of the market. As long as you're focused on cash flow and growth markets where you'll get the value increase over time, and you still got all these tax, tax benefits. You've got the loan pay down over that time so that you know the sooner you start, the sooner you got the thing paid off. The longer you wait, the longer you have to wait to get that thing paid off. And if your goal is to get the property paid off, you want to do it sooner than later. And, and you know if you're using all the cash flow to pay down your loan, it will be 30 years if you have a 30 year fixed rate loan. So you really want to do it sooner unless you take that cash flow and pay down the, the, the loan faster. You know, that's a, another way to do it, but it's a, again, long-term is, is where the focus needs to be because short-term thinking in a buy and hold strategy is just going to freak you out. You know, it's going to be like, Oh, I, I could have made more cash flow two years ago. Yeah, but every single time your tenant pays you, they're paying down your loan for you. So really, the sooner you start, the better. And of course, we like single family because of the diversification. Let me do that again. I went too fast. <laughs> uh, for many of our listeners who were in, in high-priced markets like California, you might have $1 million property that if it's vacant, you're 100% vacant. Whereas you take that and you diversify and you you buy in different markets that help you through tough times if one of those markets gets hit harder than another, then you you might, let, let's just say you're 50% vacant in a recession. You still have 50% more income than you would have if you didn't have, uh, you know, if you lost a renter in a high-priced market. So making sure that you've got more doors to help you through um, if, if one property or two or three properties are vacant, which all you have to do is lower rents and they'll get rented. Okay, so again, if you're worried about a housing market crash because there's still there's still lots of people saying that's what's coming, you've got to come back and, and look at 
borrowers and people who own these homes today. They have record high credit scores. Over 760 credit scores is the majority of them versus back in the 2000s in the easy lending time, look how many subprime loans there were compared to today. And, and then the 620 to 650, bear, it's just negligible. It's mostly very strong borrowers who pay their bills. And those people are locked into very, very low, historically low payments compared to their income. So they're not struggling. These are these homeowners today are not struggling. And I think it's a huge amount that actually don't have payments. They own it free and clear. 73% of mortgages below uh, 4%. You can see the numbers there. I don't think too many of these borrowers are going to walk away from that. They're going to probably just renovate or rent out their home if they have to move. And um, inventory is still so low. It was ticking up for a bit and coming back down. So again, to wrap this up, the key to be re recession proof, because we probably are going into one, focus on cash flow, cash flow is king, re have cash reserves. You've got to have at least six months reserves, meaning that if you buy a property and your mortgage is $1,500 or two, let's say $2,000, you wanna have six months set aside. So $12,000 per property set aside in case there's a vacancy. Uh, if you want to be extra cautious, have 12 months set aside. And that would cover vacancies and repairs. And just treat it like a business. You wouldn't run a business without reserves. And you and businesses know that there's going to be issues and there's going to be things that happen, possibly lawsuits. And you've got to have you got to have reserves set aside for those things so you're not taken aback by it. Don't over leverage. So over leverage would really be like a negative cash flow property. That's tough unless you've got so much reserves that it doesn't bother you and you really want that property because you know it's going to be worth more. You got a great deal on it. But be very careful about, about that. And then find know that financing can disappear. This is the biggest issue that multifamily and uh, commercial property is going to be facing this year and next is the they just can't refi and it's trillions of dollars are coming due. These commercial properties have to refi. They were in low rates. Now they have to refi to higher rates at a lower LTV. It's going to be a bloodbath. So um, the, the real distress, I think, is going to be in the commercial real estate, um, not so much in the residential single family. Then, of course, the right markets matter. So on our website, you you know that um, you know you go to invest, and here's a list of the different properties. These are areas that, gosh, we have been they've been on our our list for a decade, and it's just amazing how it's just still hot. Like Baltimore, Baltimore came in on Zumper as it's a it's a rental platform, a rental website, as one of the strongest rent growth markets in the country. And we have such a fantastic team that buys deep, gets deep discounts, renovates to just gorgeous brand new condition in a market where rents are going up. So just a fantastic opportunity. Birmingham, it's been on our list. I think I went to Birmingham in 2009, you know, when the markets collapsed and I'm like, wow, this city is really cool and really reinventing itself. Still a super strong market. Of course, you can see many of these Dallas <laughs> that's been on there since that was the first place we started investing and it just is not slowing down. The growth is phenomenal, especially after the pandemic. The the cities that held strong and, and stayed business friendly and landlord friendly really showed themselves over the pandemic. So more and more people are moving to those areas. They were already moving there, but that's increased because businesses saw it. They saw where they could do business. Um, probably we're not really doing Detroit, so that probably could come off there. <laughs> Got to make sure our team is listening and that we remove that. Um, same with Houston, uh, but we, Indianapolis, very strong market. Jacksonville, just again, these are markets that keep going up uh, in rents and home price. Orlando, as you saw, Pittsburgh is a great cash flow market. Tampa's 
probably my number one choice for growth. So these markets have been on there because they just keep performing over and over. Here's an example of some of the deals that are out there right now where prices have you know, really leveled off and, and a lot of these sellers will be paying points to buy down your, your rate. You can see in Jacksonville, this multifamily property at 689, gross rents at, at 5,000, cap rate year one, 6.9, cash flow. So, you know, these are these are great returns in a growth market. Dallas, 205,000, gross rent, 1,500, cap rate at six. Baltimore, again, you heard me mention it, high cap rate there, single family rental. They do a beautiful rehab. Um, purchase price only 212,000. Gross rents at 1,800. I mean, these are these are great deals, especially if you can get that rate down. But if you, even if you can't, just know that you'll probably be able to refi in about I don't know six months and get a better rate, but not have all the competition. Okay, so <clears throat> always staying informed is is what helps us make better decisions. So I'm sure you already know. I get a lot of updates on the Real Estate News podcast, and then I interview awesome people on the Real Wealth Show that keep us informed. And then I just rewrote, or I should say, I've got my new edition out of Retire Rich with Rentals. I wrote it in 2014, finally revised it this year. It's also on audio, so there's a lot of new information. If you if you read it before, it'll probably sound very different to you now as updated. All right, so let's go to questions. Will we see low interest rates again? Should we look into ARM products? Do you suggest buying down the rates in break even period is two and a half years? So I, I already went over this and I, I, Barry Habib, like I said, he, I, I did my interview with him. He is fairly certain we're gonna see inflation go down um, this year. And the Fed is certainly doing everything they can to make that happen. So there's a lot of reasons why we'll see inflation go down and mortgage rates follow inflation. So there's a very good chance we will see interest rates go down this year, which is important to know because a lot of people think that's not the case and are staying on the sidelines. So it's our time, our chance to dive in and get these deals when sellers are getting desperate. If you're planning to sell, what's the best strategy to get highest price point when buyers want to buy when mortgage rates drop? <clears throat> Honestly, if you're trying to sell, um, it's probably probably wait <laughs> till the summer. <laughs> but uh, flipping is going to be tough. But yeah, if there's any way you can wait till mortgage rates come down, that would be better. Because um, and and unless you're in an area where there's not a lot of inventory and a lot of demand, yeah. or if you're selling it as a rental property that cash flows, but flipping is going to be hard right now. All right. Um, what buying activity are we seeing predicting from iBuyers in 2023? Several slowed down operations or cut staff in 2022. So wondering if we're expecting a turnaround in 2023. It depends on what the iBuyers are trying to do, but if they were just trying to flip, I don't think they're going to come back into the market um, anytime soon. Do you have any advice for individuals wanting to get in the market but don't have cash but have great credit? Um, absolutely. There are lots of ways to get into the market. Subject to would be a great thing to learn if you want to find out about some good um, programs for learning how to do that. Just reach out to the, your investment counselor at Real Wealth and they'll they'll give you a referral because right now there might be people who need to sell. They're locked into low rates. And if you can come in and negotiate, you know, the takeover, the loan, uh, that could be a, a great way for you to get in with no money. Usually it takes more time. Of course, wholesaling is another great way that people are able to make money, but that's usually kind of flipping basically a contract. So it's not like you're able to keep the property, but if you want to keep the property subject to the way. Someone said, I live outside the U.S. in Uruguay. I should know how to say that better. Uh, welcome. Um, and starting with real estate world, it's new for me. My question is at the beginning is usual with the first property to lose money for a couple of years as a starting business, or it's possible to have cash flow at the beginning. Absolutely, you can get cash flow at the beginning. It's a little bit more difficult when you're coming from out of the country because you don't have the luxury of the the loans that we have here. But if you can get good financing, then um, 
you can cash flow or just coming in with cash. Is it safe to use the equity in your primary residence as your reserves? <coughs> um, like in a, maybe you mean in a equity line or something? Uh, I, th I think so. Personally, I think so, but um, you know, other people might might not think so. But having money set aside, buy and hold is how you make money. Buy, buy and hold real estate is how you grow tremendous wealth. Because if you can acquire an asset that you hold over time, you've got your tenants paying down your loan for you. You, and again, especially if you're buying in a growth market, you're, the value is going to go up while your tenants are paying down your debt and you're getting tax benefits. And it's probably going to appreciate just due to inflation, just due to quantitative easing and the modern monetary policy that we've seen for decades. Just look up home prices on, on the Federal Reserve, look up Fred home prices, and you'll see that inflation is nothing new. It's been happening for decades and it's going to continue because of our policies, uh, because our government loves to spend money. So they, instead of charging taxes, they just create money to do the things they want to do and that creates inflation. So it's not going anywhere. Um, so, yeah, okay. <laughs> so anyway, yes, of course you can, you can probably expect values to go up over time. How do you factor in high crime areas like Birmingham and Chicago? Uh, I don't recommend owning properties in high crime areas in any city, and every city has a section that has high crime. So uh, our our teams at Real Wealth are very, very aware of where those areas are, and they don't buy in high crime areas because they have to manage these properties. They don't want to have to deal with that. I've done it. I've invested in high crime areas, and let me tell you, it's difficult it's it's very difficult because people don't want to stay. Your tenants, this is again, buy and hold. You keeping the property to grow enormous wealth over time. And um, if you're in an area that's got high crime, that's not going to happen because it's not going to be a desirable area. People don't want to live where they're going to get the car stolen and or they're afraid for their safety or their, the safety of their children. So um, unless you're really an expert at knowing how to invest in those areas we we don't recommend it and we don't do it at real wealth and our teams that we trust and rely on there's 15 of them nationwide they would never look at those areas so we don't recommend it we don't have it we don't offer it and um every city's got it so you have to know how to where to be it's all about location and being in the um the areas that have low crime and one of the ways that you can understand what where the crime is 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 websites like city-data.com where you can zoom in to neighborhoods and and get that data. Do you think an arm loan is a good idea in this market? I do. I do because I do think rates are going to come down, so why not get a, a lower rate now now and refi into a, a longer term rate when rates are lower? And and some of those arms are five, seven, even ten year arms, so they're still pretty long term. Uh, what do you think of Columbus? I think Columbus is a great market. We don't currently have a team there, but there's a great university and a lot of growth there. So we, we do like Columbus. Uh, explain more about institutional investors. In, institutional investors is basically Wall Street, you know, so the Blackstones of the world, the, the billion dollar funds. Um, that, you know, we just, <laughs> us little guys can't really compete with because they've got so much more money than us. Clearly, Wall Street is seeing the single family rental business as their next frontier. They kind of came into multifamily decades ago when that was kind of a mom and pop business and saw the benefit and very much invested into multifamily. And now they're seeing the benefit in single family, I think up until this last decade, they didn't know how to manage hundreds of thousands of homes, so it's easier to manage apartments, but they figured it out. And they're doing a lot of build to rent communities that are just kind of horizontal apartments. So it's been made very clear that these Wall Street investors see uh, single family investing as the next frontier for them where they can uh, both get cash flow today and probably growth in the future. 
because again, there's just not enough single family homes out there for the demand. How do we find areas with low inventory? Um, you know, that data is available online. You can, you know, first go to the teams that we work with. They'll they'll have that data for you, but really any agent would would be able to tell you what the inventory is. What part of Tampa is a good investment? Uh, we are kind of, our team in Tampa loves sort of the outskirts about 30 miles north. I may be getting that wrong, but it, Tampa itself has become very expensive. Uh, so it, like in most cases, we don't actually buy in the in the city because the cities tend to be more expensive, we buy in the suburbs. So it would be the suburbs outside of Tampa where, where it's more affordable and where people like to live. They like to have a yard and have a bigger house in the suburbs. But our Tampa team can definitely show you a map and show you where they're investing or just look at some of the webinars that they've done at Real Wealth and, and they'll show you where they what they recommend. What market do you re recommend for maximum cash on cash or new construction? I would have to say Baltimore, even though it's not new construction, it's almost new construction because there's they're really deeply renovated to close to new. Uh, but you know, so that's a that's a great market with great cash on cash return. I'm very, very happy to say that we have a brand new market. We used to be in this market, but uh, didn't have a team there until recently, but we're opening up um, San Antonio that has multifamily, like one to four units, brand new. And if you just talk to your investment counselor at Real Wealth, they can tell you about those. They're going to go very, very quickly. So San Antonio is a great market with new deals, new brand new multifamily that cash flow really well. And uh, again, uh, Baltimore, Indianapolis is, as I mentioned, a wonderful team with quality product and, and higher cash on cash, and our new Cleveland team as well. So those would be the ones I would focus on through Real Wealth is Baltimore, Indianapolis, Cleveland, and then take a look at the San Antonio markets as well. Okay. I want to partner in senior living. We don't, we don't focus on that. I, sorry about that. The property is listed with your teams on the website. Does anyone ever negotiate those prices or should we pretty much accept to pay what is asking? They seem to be great price points, just more out of curiosity if people are having to offer higher, if they're going to ask typically. We have, um, you know, basically had those conversations already that, hey, these numbers need to work. This is the cash flow we're shooting for and the price needs to reflect that. So our teams are already, they've already discounted to make sure that the cash flow is where we would be willing to present it. Obviously, we're not gonna present negative cash flow properties. And so with interest rates up, our partners had to bring prices down and, and or buy the rate down. So it's going to be one of those things to make sure that we're hitting the cash flow that we require. Um, with that said, of course, you can always negotiate. They will either say yes or no. And uh, in, in some cases, the, there's already so many buyers for these that they may not be willing to, but hey, you can always ask. Uh, regarding Barry Habib, 5% for investors or homeowner, homeowners. Yeah, homeowners. Point.com shares appreciation of your home to get money from your home, okay. What do you think of investment in new construction which will complete later in 2023? Um, if you got the right contract price, why not? Yeah, why not? You know that by the time you close, interest rates will probably be lower, but you've locked in today's price. Make sure you understand the contract and um, and understand if they have the ability to raise the price or not. Uh, so it, making sure you under understand your contract is really important. Right now, um, builders should be able to give you a set price because we're out of the insanity of last year where they really just couldn't bid. They just couldn't tell you what the price would be because prices kept changing. But that's, as you saw from my slides, that's over. They should be able to know exactly what it's gonna cost to to build that house. And, um, and so the contract really shouldn't allow for too much uh, change in price in my opinion, because it's all stabilized now. Uh, 
Yeah, Birmingham seems to have a lot of shootings based on spot time. Yes, of course, every city has crime. You don't want to be in those areas, but there's lovely areas of Birmingham. I live near LA and trust me, if you look up crime, <laughs> you'd wonder why I live here, but in the areas we live in, we don't experience that. So you just have to have a really good boots on the street to make sure you're not in high crime areas. We'll be using a HELOC to enter investing. Is it still worth using funds to buy properties even if the cash flow will only cover the loan HELOC payment? Again, you gotta look long-term, long-term. If you're in a growth market, as far as I'm concerned, and this is just my opinion, if you're in a growth market and you can buy a property that covers its costs and you don't need that cash flow, what you're looking at is 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, trying to create uh, financial freedom for yourself then don't, you know, just don't worry about today. It's the pay down. It's the pay down of the loan through the leverage of somebody else paying that loan down for you and the tax benefits you get from that and uh, the additional cash flow and most likely increased prices over time if you're in a growing market. So yeah, I, I don't mind so much if the cash flow is lower if I'm in a growth market. Because I I'm I I invest for that big boom. You know, I don't want to be in cash flow markets that where there's never any growth. I know some people like those markets, but if anything goes wrong with the house and you've got to replace a roof, that kind of wipes out your cash flow. So I want to know that at least the value is going up. That's my personal opinion. Uh how do you feel about Nevada and Arizona for buy and hold? Uh I know that Arizona it has more inventory than it's had. Uh, but those those are areas that have been hot spots and are kind of getting hit right now. And um, so it doesn't necessarily cash flow that well, but you're probably getting much better prices than you would have last year because there's more inventory. So it's it's worth looking at. We don't have teams there, but I would say things are on sale there. But there's a lot of inventory and probably a lot of rentals on the market. So just make sure you really understand uh, if you're buying for your primary, this could be a wonderful time. If you're buying for a rental, you need to really understand the rental market because there is a lot of inventory in those areas. Um, looking into San Antonio, yes, we've got a great new team there. So talk to your investment counselor at Real Wealth to find out about those. Uh, Outlook on Ventura County, do you think prices will go down? I don't know, but you know, even if they do, they'll come back up eventually. So I, I wouldn't want to sell anything right now. I'd probably want to hold it until the market's frenzied again, which it most likely will at some point. So if you can keep it rented, that would probably be my my recommendation. You don't want to you don't want to do that what what the masses do, which is to to buy high and sell low. <laughs> you know, you want to uh, sell when it's high. Okay, in the face of a recession, would you recommend using a home equity line to buy additional single family homes? Um, Rich and I just got an equity line and that's what we're planning on doing, uh, again, because we're in it for the long term. But boy, I was a little bit surprised at the rate, it's high. <laughs> it's pretty high to make it work. Your Indianapolis team, do they renovate after, during, they, they renovate before. Uh, we prefer that all the renovation is done before so that you can get your inspection and know exactly what you're getting. If you buy, and have it renovated after you know there's always surprises and things can not go the way you thought or it could just cost more to renovate so as long as you're aware that that's a possibility then you know it do it but it's hard we we don't offer that at real wealth and it's really hard to manage a renovation from afar which areas do we buy in north texas uh all over north texas but we're really focusing on the sherman area are your teams in Florida concerned about the high insurance premiums? Yeah, insurance is definitely going up, but we stay out of flood zones. That's why we go in the suburbs and and again not near the not near the flood zones because that can be much higher insurance and also higher risk to your property. What do you think about Cleveland? We have a great team in Cleveland. That city is really turning out to be a big medical industry, and of course we know that. We've got a lot of aging baby boomers, so medical towns are in high demand. So yes, we like Cleveland. Um, there's certain neighborhoods in Cleveland that I would stay out of because uh, they're just not landlord friendly, but the local team would, would know. 
What do you think about cost of maintaining a single family over time versus HOA of 500? Yeah, HOAs are tough. I, I don't really love condos, if that's what you're talking about, because there could also be, you know, fees that you don't know about, like renovations that, um, assessments that you don't know about, things that need to be fixed. So I, I'm not a huge fan of the condo and then the HOA fees that come with it. I'd personally rather have a single family home. Uh, what do you think of, or, or like one to four unit, what do you think of markets with stagnant declining populations, but high cash flow, Baltimore? We love ba Baltimore. Um, I don't like markets that are declining in population. <laughs> so I'd be careful of those. Which institutions offer HELOCs on rental properties? I don't know of any, but if somebody does, put it in the notes. I've heard rumor of certain lenders offering rates in the fives and fours. Do you know about that? I don't, but if anyone does, let us know. Some of your property teams are showing lower growth, 3% versus Dallas at 6%. Is 3% still good growth when you have some good cash flow? Um, you know, at this point, everybody's just guessing on what growth will be. Uh, so you need to really put your own number in there and nobody knows, but I can tell you that CoreLogic came out and they think that they'll be sort of on average about 4% growth next year. So that means some areas will be higher and some lower. So um, I think 3% is a safe number, but if you're, if you're buying for the long term, don't, don't worry about it because over time it's going to go up in value most likely. <clears throat> Does climate change affect your target market outlook? Um, like I said, so many people moved to Miami. I was always afraid that Miami was going to have sinkholes and be underwater. But <laughs> it seems to have been the hottest market in the country. So uh, I don't know. We we don't we don't like to buy along the coast, and we stay inland because of uh, I don't know so much of its climate change, but hurricanes are definitely a thing. Do you have thoughts about the Kansas City Metro? I know Real Wealth used to have a provider there. Yeah, we don't, we do like Kansas City. We had trouble with property managers there. So once we can get that figured out, we'd probably be in that market again, but we're not currently. What areas of Baltimore? We'll just go on the Baltimore page and you can connect with the team in Baltimore, uh, the Real Wealth page and they'll tell you all about it, all about which neighborhoods they're in. Oh, I was gonna come back on and be on camera, so hi. <laughs> hi, everyone. <laughs> okay, uh, now you know that there's a human behind the voice. Does Real Wealth track approved government investments into tech broken down by US market? I'm not sure, sorry. Uh, IQ Credit Union does HELOCs on investment properties at 70 LTV. There it is, the power of the network. Wonderful. Ridge Lending offers HELOCs on investment properties, but only if they're in first lien position, which kind of doesn't sound like a HELOC, but I guess it is. All right. So I think it's probably the one that is, it's kind of a cool thing where you, I think, where you could put your, um, your savings or, you know, have your, your bank account be in that HELOC so that if you've got money in savings, you're not paying as much on the HELOC, but you would want Ridge Lending to explain that to you. It's a little bit difficult, I think, to apply, but it sounds like a really interesting loan. That's it on the questions. I've got another appointment I need to get on. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day. And uh, if you've got more questions, send them over to your investment counselor at Real Wealth. Take care. Bye-bye.